Hi and welcome to another fuss free gluten free video. With Easter just around the corner I thought today we'd make some hot cross buns but not just any hot cross buns, today we're going to make chocolate hot cross buns because let's face it at Easter you can never have too much chocolate and honestly when you're gluten free, dairy free and soy free it can be hard to have too much chocolate because we well, just can't find it in the shops. So I really love hot cross buns and I haven't been able to find any that we can buy that are gluten free, dairy free and soy free. So I thought I'd make my own and share the recipe with you. Now they're really, really easy to make but there are a few steps involved. The good news is it's not a lot of hands on time but there is a bit of um, time where you just have to leave it to sit to rise because we are using yeast in this. So let's get started. So the first stage, we need to activate our yeast. Now I'm just using dried yeast here because I find it's really easy to, to get. You can buy it in any supermarket and it's easy to work with. So we're starting off with just two sachets. So they're about oh, seven grams each or about two teaspoons. So all up we're looking at about uh, one metric tablespoon, which is 20 mils or um, four teaspoons. So we'll just pop those in there. Give it a good shake because it tends to really stick to the inside of the packet and we want to get it all out because this is what's going to make them rise. So we add our second one in. Now I made a batch of these um, oh, about three days ago for the family but not chocolate ones, I did just traditional fruit ones. And so we had sultanas and currants in them and then I put, what spices did I put? Some cinnamon nutmeg, clove and allspice and they were delicious, they're, they're all gone, they, like half the batch was gone before they were even cooled from the oven, so everyone insisted I make another batch but I thought this time I'd do chocolate ones and I'd show you how to do it. So I've got our yeast in there and then we're just going to add a bit of sugar because you need the sugar to feed the yeast and to activate it. So a tablespoon of sugar, so it's essentially equal parts yeast and sugar. And then we're going to add some milk. Now I'm using coconut milk here but you could use almond milk, you could use rice milk, whichever is your favourite in your house. So we're just going to mix it all in and you just want to make sure that the yeast gets all um, evenly mixed in the milk and there's no big clumps. over a spoon just because you want to break up those clumps of the yeast. So give it a good little mix around. Okay, I can't see any more lumps. Okay. Alright, so get a nice clean tea towel, pop it over the top like that. And then you want to sit this in a nice warm spot in the kitchen for oh, 10 to 15 minutes. If it's a cold day, it will take longer for the, for the yeast to start bubbling. If it's a really cold day, what you can do is get put, the, put this in the top shelf of your oven, of a cold oven, and then boil the kettle and put, get one of your mixing bowls and put it in the bottom of the oven and fill it with the boiling water and close the oven. So you've got your bowl of boiling water on the bottom with this bowl with the yeast mix on the top shelf and then leave it in there with the door closed for about 10 or 15 minutes and that just gives it a nice cosy warm environment on a cold day. But we've got an absolutely beautiful day here, it's lovely and warm, so I'm just going to leave this to sit on the bench for about 10-15 minutes and what we're looking for and what we're waiting for is for that yeast to really start eating into the sugar, releasing its gases and making lots and lots of foamy bubbles. So I'll leave that and I'll be back in 15 minutes when that's ready. Okay, it's been about 15 minutes so let's take a look. Oh, that's looking perfect. It's really bubbly and foamy. It's really come alive. You can see it's frothing away and bubbles are popping and it's just exactly what we're looking for. Alright, so now we're going to move on to making the dough itself. So I'll put that to the side for a minute. And in a big bowl we've got four cups of plain flour. So just use your, which, whichever is your favourite gluten free baking powder. So I just use an all grain Bran, and you want plain flour, not self-raising flour, because we're using the yeast in this recipe to make our eyes. So I like to sift it, just to get out any lumps that are in there. And also, it, um, it just helps to add a bit more air and, and lighten the dough too. I've probably put a bit too much in my sift, but that's alright, we'll persevere. 
I always make a bit of mess anyway. Okay, so I've almost finished sifting all of that in there now. I've got most of it in the bowl, although some of it on the bench like I always do. So I'm just going to add in some cacao powder now. So I've got, I think it's about a tablespoon and a half. And that's just to give it a slight hint of a chocolate flavour to the dough. But we don't want to make it, well I'm not trying to make it super chocolatey in this recipe. I mean obviously if you wanted to you could. Um, but I want to still be able to taste and, and to really notice the, the chunks of cacao nibs that we're going to put in. And also if it's really dark you won't see the chocolate crosses on top. Alright, so I've sifted all the flour and the cacao into there now. And now I'm going to add the cacao nibs. So these are cacao nibs. They, um, they're, made, they're basically just chopped up bits of the cacao beans. So they're a bit bitter, um, quite rich in flavour and really, really chocolatey. So there's no sweetener in this at all. So they are a bit bitter. Um, but I really like them. They, and they have a really nice crunch too. So they add that extra texture to, to, your, um, to your buns as well. So we're just going to tip those in like that. And then I like to just stir them through the flour. And what this does is it, it coats the nibs in the flour mix and that way it tends to hold them suspended in the dough a little bit better and just enables everything to mix a little bit more evenly because you don't want to end up with some buns that have heaps and heaps and others that are missing out. Well, I mean, you're not going to mind the ones with heaps and heaps but everyone's going to fight over who has to have the one that hasn't got enough. All right. So next we're going to add in our liquid ingredients. So I've got a third of a cup of ghee here. So if you're concerned about ghee, go and check out the article on my website, cindyleekennedy.com, and you'll see why it's safe to use ghee even if you are avoiding dairy. So even my daughter who is extremely allergic to dairy, as in like ends up in hospital, she's fine with ghee. Obviously, otherwise I wouldn't be using it. Um, I've got an egg here, one egg, so I just want to break that up a little bit before it goes in. So tip that in. About a teaspoon of vanilla. There we go. And then we're going to add our lovely foamy yeast mixture. So I pour that in. Like so. Get all that goodness because remember that's what's going to make the dough rise. And now we just give it a really good mix. Now you could do this in a stand mixer with a dough hook if you want because it is making quite a thick dough as you can see here. It's not a wet batter. But honestly for all the effort of getting it out I find it's just as easy to mix it either with a, a large metal spoon or just a rubber spatula like this. So just mix it in until it's all nice and evenly mixed and you've got a nice smooth dough. Okay, so once we've got that all nice and evenly mixed, we're just going to flatten it down a bit like that. Scrape it off our spatula because we're finished with that for now. Just wash my hands. Okay, and now we're going to leave this sit for about 45 minutes to an hour and let it rise. So, like I said before, um, cover it up. And if it's a nice warm day, just leave it on your kitchen bench, which is what I'll be doing today. Um, but if it's a cold day, back in the oven with that bowl of boiling water underneath. And that just gives it a really nice warm cozy spot to rise. So we're going to leave this for 45 minutes and, and I'll check it and then we'll come back and we'll shape them into our buns. I'll see you then. Okay, so I've had this dough sitting for about 45 minutes because it's a nice warm day. You could leave it an hour if you think it needs it. And um, it's looking fantastic. So it's a nice rested dough, nice and soft and springy. So now we're going <coughs> to, excuse me, turn it out and we're going to shape it into our buns. So I like to just dust the surface of my bench first with a little bit of, again, it's just your general sort of all-purpose gluten-free baking powder, uh, baking powder, sorry, baking flour. Um, I, I like to use the All Grain brand. It's uh, obviously gluten-free, but dairy-free and soy-free too. So something just to, to keep an eye out. All right, so we're going to tip this out. This is 
see it's looking a lovely chocolatey colour. You can see all those yummy little chopped chips from the cacao nibs. So I just want to, you don't really need to knead it, but we just want to shape it into a long sort of a, a sausage shape. So just roll it out. It is a little bit sticky, so that's why we've got the, the flour down. So just, oops, gently roll it. Okay, so roll it into a nice long sausage like that. Try and keep it fairly uniform in thickness. And then I just take a knife and cut it up. So you can cut it into 12, 16, how many, however many pieces you like. Um, you could even actually just shape it into a, a large log and bake it as a loaf, but it will take longer to cook if you do it that way. So I like to do them into about 16 because then they're a little bit smaller and obviously with kids I don't like giving them huge big, huge big buns. So just cut them in half and in half. And then cut each of those into four. So, it does stick to the knife a little bit, but you could just break them off as well. You don't have to use a knife, or you could use a um, like a pastry pastry cutter or a bench scraper. I do have one somewhere, but I don't know. It seems to have disappeared, so I'm just using a knife today. There we go. Then we set that to the side. So now all we want to do is just shape these into a nice little bun shape, like that. There we go. And we're going to pop them onto our tray. So I've just got just a regular baking tray here and I like to line them with baking paper. It stops them sticking and it just makes washing up easier at the end because we all know I really hate washing up. Okay, so shape that and on we go. So just... Gently sort of press them into the right shape and pop them on the tray. So I like to pop them on with just a small, just a small sort of gap between them. I'll hold it up so you can see, just like that. So you can see there's a little bit of a gap. That just allows the air to get in there and, and to circulate while they're baking. So keep going with those. And then we're going to let these sit to rise again. Now if you're doing, because we're doing chocolate ones, the crosses on them are going to be made with chocolate so they'll go on after they've baked and we've let them cool a little bit otherwise the chocolate will just run everywhere. Um, excuse me. <coughs> but if you're doing the traditional ones with the fruit and spice uh, then you make the paste up and you pipe that onto the, onto the buns before they go in the oven but not until they've had their second rise. So you would still be shaping them like this. I didn't cut them very evenly, but oh well. It'll be a race to get see who gets the big ones, and no doubt the middle ones will get left to the end. All has the way. Um, yeah, so if you're making your regular ones with fruit and spice, you would shape the buns like this now, let them sit, and then after they've sat for, I like to leave them another half an hour, right before they go in the oven, that's when you pipe your um, paste crosses on the top so that they bake in. I don't pipe them on before I leave them sit because I put a tea towel over the top and if you've piped them on and then put the tea towel, it all just sticks to the tea towel and it will just make a huge mess because it's, it's quite wet. So, but we're doing chocolate ones today so the crosses go on after they've baked. Alright, so there you go, you can see we've got our 16 there. So we just cover them with the cloth again and that didn't take long at all. So cover them with a cloth. I'm going to clean up my bench because I've made a big mess like I always do. And we're going to leave these to sit for another, I like to give them a good half hour. So you could leave them, if it was a really warm day, I'd probably only give them 15 minutes. If it was a really cold day, probably 45. Actually, if it was a really cold day, I'd do the same trick as last time and pop them in the, in the closed oven with a bowl of hot water. But I'm just going to leave them on the bench like this for today. So we'll give them about 20 minutes, half an hour. Then we'll come back and pop them in the oven. I'll see you then. Okay, so these have been sitting for about 20-25 minutes and they're ready to go in the oven. So you want to make sure you preheat the oven. So I set my timer um, for these for I think 25 minutes to check them. So my oven is really old and takes forever to heat up. 
So I set one alarm for 15 minutes to remind me to turn the oven on and then the second one for 25 to say that the oven should be hot and these are ready to go in. So just one thing I like to do quickly, you don't have to, but my own personal preference is I like to just give them a really quick spray with um, an olive oil spray. It just, um, you could give like an egg wash if you wanted, but I find this is just as quick and easy. So just a really quick spray over the top. And this just helps to brown them. So that's just an olive oil, not fly spray. <laughs> I have this paranoia that every time I use I use this stuff, I'm putting fly spray on my food. I don't know why, because I've never had fly spray in the house, but it's one of those silly things that you get in your head. Anyway, enough of that. So these are ready to go in the oven. So I'm going to give them 25 minutes, and then I'll check them. And if you've got an uneven oven like I do, make sure you turn them around halfway through so that they cook evenly. So we'll pop these in the oven, and then in 25 minutes we'll check them, and I'll see you then. Oh, these smell amazing. I wish you could smell them. So they're all cooked now and they're lightly brown, straight out of the oven. Now this next step I'm going to do is completely optional. I'm going to make a glaze to put on the top. So your traditional um, hot cross buns, some people even call them sticky buns because they have this really um, sticky, a little bit sweet glaze that goes over the top. So with your traditional hot cross buns, they'd already have the cross on them and then you would put the glaze. But because we're doing the chocolate ones and the cross has to go on last when they're cold so that the chocolate doesn't all melt and go everywhere. So we're going to put the glaze on now because the glaze has to go on while they're hot. Now I do like to put, I don't usually put the glaze on when I make the fruit ones because the fruit inside them sweetens them up and the spices do as well. But remember there's very, very little sugar in these, right? We only added it with the yeast at the very beginning and we've got the really bitter cacao nibs in there as well as some cacao powder. So we just want to add a tiny little bit of sweetness, of course if you don't just leave this part off. So we're going to make a really quick glaze. Now this is super easy. So all we need is a tablespoon of sugar. Oh, the spoon's not going to fit in there. Alright, so a tablespoon of sugar. A tablespoon of water. And a teaspoon of gelatin. I'm just using the gelatin powder, you don't have to muck around with um, leaves or anything fussy like that. So I sprinkle that in and now we're just going to heat it really, really gently, very quickly. So turn it on, might help. <laughs> Alright, so I'm just going to stir it with a whisk just while the sugar and the gelatin melt. Okay, so that's looking pretty good now. Both our sugar and our gelatin have dissolved. Turn that off. Now you don't want that to come to the boil because if it comes to the boil it's going to go really really frothy and then when you brush it on you're not going to get a really nice smooth clear glaze. It's going to be a lot cloudier and have the little bubbles set in it. So that's still a bit warm. Of course it's just coming out of the oven. Alright so I'll set it up here and all we're going to do now is just brush this on. So just grab your pastry brush and brush it over the buns. Now this makes them look really pretty because it gives it a beautiful sort of glossy shine and it just turns them from something yummy to something really really special and as you saw it took like one minute to make it. Now don't worry about the pot, it's really easy to wash because it's gelatin and it's sugar. If, if you find that it's, it's um, sort of set a bit on the inside of it, just soak it in some water for 20 minutes and it will literally soak right off because the sugar and the, and the gelatin will just dissolve in water. And when this cools, it'll set to a lovely sticky, sticky glaze. So be warned, when you give your kids these, don't put them next to anything you don't want sticky fingers on. My dad always complains that I don't make sticky buns often enough for him. He, he just likes them as sticky buns, so we make them without crosses for the rest of the year. With crosses for Easter, without crosses the rest of the year. Hot cross buns at Easter, sticky buns the rest of the time. Okay, so that's done. So I'm just going to let these cool now. I might actually sit them on a rack to cool, just to let the air flow underneath, because sometimes if you leave them on a tray and the air can't get under there, they, the steam comes out and it can make them go a bit sort of heavy and, and a bit gooey on the bottom. You want them to get that nice crust. So I'm going to pop these on a tray, oh, on a tray, on a um, 
wire rack and let these cool and then when they're cool we'll come back and we're going to pipe our chocolate crosses on there. So I'll see you then. Okay, so we're up to the final section now where we're going to put our crosses on our buns. So this is really easy. All we're doing is making a really quick and simple chocolate and we're just going to pipe that on. So there's three main ingredients that you do need to have and then I like to add an extra two in just for that little bit extra flavour. So our three main ingredients that we need for the chocolate are cacao butter. Now this, it's not butter, <laughs> this is the fat. So this is the fat that comes from the cocoa bean and you can buy that in your health food shop. It just comes in chunks like this. Um, I think sometimes you can buy it in a more finely ground up one but I just get it like this because that's what all they have where I, uh, where I shop. Um, and oh, It's got the most beautiful, really rich chocolatey flavour to it. So this is what gives that really intense, luscious, dark chocolate kind of um, feel. So if you can't get your hands on this or you don't want to spend the money because it is a little bit pricey, you can use coconut oil instead. But you'll probably need to keep this in the fridge because the coconut oil at room temperature on a warm day like today, it will just melt. So if I pulled a jar of coconut oil out of my pantry now, it would all be liquid. So if it was winter, it would be fine. But this time of year, you would need to put it in the fridge. This, however, as you can see, is solid, very solid at room temperature. So that's the first ingredient you have to have. The second one is cacao powder. Um, so that's, again, just your, your chocolate flavouring. And the third one is some sort of a sweetener. Now, you need to use a liquid one. So you can use honey or maple syrup. I've used both of them in the past. But they do obviously impart... Oh, this fly. They do impart a flavour to it. So if you like honey or maple syrup in your chocolate, by all means, go for it. I sometimes use, use it just because it's there. Um, and obviously, honey is really good for you. Um, but today I'm using rice malt syrup because I don't want the sweetener to flavour the chocolate. I just want it to sweeten it. Now, it has to be a liquid one. I find I have tried it a few times with a granular sugar and it, it just makes the chocolate go really gritty and grainy and we don't want that. We want a nice smooth mouthfeel. So they're the three essential ingredients that you really need. And the other two that I like to add just for that little, that little extra flavour is vanilla, um, a good quality vanilla extract, not essence. Never use vanilla essence because it's artificial. You always get the extract. And the other one is just a little bit of salt. Salt is fantastic with chocolate. It um, it just it seems to really bring the flavour out. So we don't want a lot. We don't want it to taste salty like you would with the salted caramel, for example. Sorry about that fly. It's driving me nuts. Um, but just a little pinch really accent accentuates the chocolate flavour. Right, so let's get stuck in. So we're going to start by getting our cacao butter. I've got about 35 grams of it here. Now obviously it's really hard to measure accurately when it's in chunks like this. You can chop it up with a knife. Um, if, you, if you add a little bit more, that's fine, but don't go under because you do need that to, um, to make the chocolate set once it's cooled. So we're now going to melt that. So you just want to melt it on a low heat. So you want to do it on a really low heat. Now if you're doing this in a, over a standard stove, probably best to do a, a double boiler. But this is an induction cooktop, so it, I can do it on a, on a really low heat. So that won't take long to melt. So while that's melting, we're going to add our rice malt syrup. So we just want two tablespoons of that. everywhere. I always have to wash it under the tap after I've used it. It makes such a mess. Alright, okay. right, so we're just going to let that melt down. You can just give it a bit of a stir as it goes. I use a whisk because once we put the cacao powder in, you're going to want to get rid of all the lumps. and I. I always find when you're getting rid of lumps, a whisk is always the way to go. So we'll just melt that down. So this is what it looks like as it's starting to melt down. Okay, so we're almost there. That's just about melted now. Okay, so that's looking really good now. So we're going to keep moving on. So we can turn the heat off. Um, if you use an induction cooker and you want to know what temperature, I only had that at 60 degrees. So nice and low temperature. So now we're going to add our remaining ingredients. So just a pinch of salt, 
about a quarter of a teaspoon of vanilla. Not, not much. Again, you don't want it to taste vanilla. We're just really adding it to round out the flavour of our chocolate. And then we add our cacao powder. And we whisk this all now until it's nice and smooth. Alright, that's looking really good now, lovely and smooth. Okay, so now we're ready to pipe our crosses, our chocolate crosses, onto our buns. So I find the easiest way to do this, you don't even need a piping bag, just a plastic Ziploc bag, or it doesn't even matter if it's not a Ziploc bag, just any small, clean bag. And we're going to put it into a cup to get the cup to hold it, with one of the corners facing down. Alright, so I'll just stick it in there like that, kind of open it up over the cup and push one of the corners down in there like that. Okay, so we're just going to pour our melted chocolate, our liquid chocolate, into the bag. So it's really important when you're making this chocolate that you have the temperature as low as possible. You really want to have it at the lowest possible temperature to melt that cacao butter um, because otherwise it can go really gritty and grainy. Right, so we lift it up now and we hold it like that so you can see that it's all gone down into one corner. We just gather it up and twist it. It is a bit warm so be careful. And then, oh, that is warm, just snip off the end with a pair of scissors and it's going to start coming out. And we're just going to run this across our buns like that. Be careful it is a bit hot. If it's too hot, you can let it sit for a few minutes to cool. And that will also have the added advantage of thickening. And so you'll get thicker crosses as you go. All right. So any that you've got left, you can just pipe it onto a baking tray and let it set. Or if you've got some moulds or even just um, ice cube trays are great just to put that extra in and then pop it out and you've got little chocolates as well. So they're all done. So all we need to do now is leave them to cool and let that chocolate set and they're ready to dive in. So give them a go, enjoy them, they're absolutely delicious and I can't wait to hear what you think. And I'll also put the recipe up on my website for your normal hot cross buns with the fruit and the spices. So go to www cindyleekennedy.com and you can get the recipes for both there. And I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Bye!